So Shadow and Bone is back with season two and I am so very late. I'm so sorry, uh, being sick really set me back. But I was a pretty big fan of the first season of the show. I hadn't read the book before watching that first season, mainly so I could just see how it would stand on its own as a show for like the average viewer. And I found it really enjoyable. I think the chemistry with so many of the characters is fantastic. I like the Grisha as a concept and the different abilities they have. And while some of the central characters are a bit bland, there's always someone around that shines through one way or another. I think my main takeaway ended up being that I really loved all the lore surrounding the Grisha and the Sun Summoner, Morozova and the Darkling. But that side of the story and those characters were nowhere near as interesting as the Crows. Because in a stroke of genius that might also have slightly been their downfall in terms of focus, the showrunners decided to find a way to link the Crows into the central Shadow and Bone story as a little bit of a prequel before we would have gotten their story in Six of Crows. And they just stole the show and really elevated the entire season. They're the ragtag group of of underdogs pulling off heists. I love heists. But then that leaves Shadow and Bone with a problem. People love the crows, so they need to keep finding ways to integrate them into the larger story with Alina. And in this season, it just doesn't necessarily always make sense. They're just like pulling plot points from like later in the series and finding ways to like fit them in now. And a lot of it is interesting, it's just not always as interesting as it could be. It also makes certain characters just act like idiots so you can keep checking in on them. So I find the crows are the most enjoyable when they're just kind of doing their own thing and and not necessarily quite as much when they're just being like ham-fisted into a different story. And then on top of having to work the crows in, they decided that they were gonna cover the second and third Shadow and Bones books in this single eight episode season. They condensed a lot and switched a lot of things up to the point that it's almost futile to try to really compare them. And then they just completely go in a different direction with the ending. When I first heard they were doing that, I was worried that they were just trying to like really rush through the Shadow and Bone storyline so they could just like dive into a Six of Crows spinoff, which I do still think is in the work, but they're definitely planning on continuing the story with Alina. Now I did watch this season before continuing with the books again, just to see how it would stand on its own merit. And for the most part, it is still very enjoyable, but it is, it's so messy, especially when you start getting into those later episodes. Like literally we're in the last episode and I thought the whole thing was gonna like wind down and end. And I noticed there were still 40 minutes left. And in a lot of ways, I think they do a pretty good job condensing these stories down and then like maintaining emotionally resonant conversations. There's still good action scenes, but how how condensed it is means that the stakes feel kind of like they don't exist much anymore. At times I felt like I was losing track of story beats even though I watched the whole season in one day. There's like so many new characters that I don't really care about. So like it does get quite messy. And to keep track of all these stories, I am so glad I had today's sponsor, Cometeer, to keep me alert. Cometeer is coffee that's been flash frozen to lock in freshness and deliciousness. And every month they'll deliver a variety of coffees customized to your roast preference, so light, dark, medium, and even decaf right to your door. And all you have to do to make the perfect cup is to keep the capsules in your freezer and melt one into a beverage of your choice anytime you want. I managed to find some eggnog in stores recently, so I figured I'd give an eggnog latte a go by mixing the capsule in some warmed eggnog and it's it's so good. I'm always just so blown away by how good Cometeer tastes regardless of what kind of drink I make. And that versatility really is one of my favorite things about Cometeer. Instead of messing around with different machines that give me like bitter coffee or going out to buy coffee, I can have perfect lattes, coffees, and whatever else tickles my fancy every time. And right now you can try Cometeer with the best deal by using code JEDI to save $20 off your first two orders for a total of $40 off. So make sure to use my code over at cometeer.com or click the link in the description down below. But let's hop in with where we left off. Right now, Alina believes she's destroyed the Fold and the Darkling. She and Mal head off alone while the crows head back to Ketterdam to reclaim the crow's nest where Nina also heads because she's trying to find a way to get Matthias out of Hellgate prison. If you want more of a refresher, feel free to go back and watch my video on the first season and first book. And just know that I was talking about age gaps and power dynamics and relationships. I was talking about the nature of the fictional character characters, not the adult actors portraying them. So you might think we're all fine and dandy now, you know? Saint Alina, the Sun Summoner, getting to hide off with her love, but no. We know that Kirigan, the Darkling, Alexander, whatever you prefer, is not dead. Alina seems to be having these weird visions of him from within the Fold, but it's growing. So while she does still believe that he's dead, it becomes clear very soon that the Fold has come back, but just pushed into a different location, which was a very menacing scene at the end of the first season. And honestly, this season just 
didn't manage to maintain that tension because of how quickly it's moving from major event to major event. But now all of Ravka believe that Alina worked with the Darkling to increase the fold. So she and Mel are enemies number one, but thankfully there are still people who believe she was acting for good and have faith in her as a literal religious saint, allowing her to escape. So her current plan is to find the second Morozova amplifier, the Sea Whip, to gain more power against the fold. But things aren't going much better for the Crows. They return to Ketterdam only to find the Crows Club taken over by Pekka Rollins and renamed the Kalish Prince, which is when the show starts infusing some of Kaz's backstory a lot earlier than we would have gotten it. And the reason why he hates Pekka Rollins is because when he was a boy, Pekka scammed his older brother out of all the money they got following the death of their parents, which resulted in his brother getting sick with firepox and dying. And Kaz has a bunch of trauma around this because he at one point was also presumed dead and sent out on that barge of bodies before he somehow woke up and he had to use his brother's dead body to get back to the mainland, which has led him to be extremely touch averse, so he always wears gloves to avoid severe panic attacks from PTSD. And they handle this stuff so well, it feels so natural, it's palpable, and does a great job trickling this info in over the season. I've just given it to you all now instead. I don't necessarily love how much they take care of this season in terms of certain people's backstories, while understanding that the showrunners absolutely needed to infuse some stuff in because people are such big fans of the Crows. But the issue is that it just kind of starts messing around with some of the known timelines and you're just kind of wondering like how they're gonna handle that going forward. And it's not just Kaz that they're speeding along, like it seemed pretty clear that Jesper was a Grisha in the first season and then like you read Six of Crows and it's confirmed. But they have the other Crows finding out earlier now too he also ends up having this epiphany about not wanting to hide it anymore this season, which is way ahead of schedule. So some of the choices really ended up feeling like they didn't know if they were going to get further seasons to work with, so they just wanted to make sure this was all out there now, but then they are also just leaving plot points open left and right. And on top of losing the Crows Club, Pekka Rollins has them set up for the murder of Tanta Helene, and they only managed to escape their fate because this schmarmy fuck is paid to speak with them, and apparently he was the one who originally paid the Crows to track down Alina in the first place, and like, when you kind of find out more about what's going on here. I don't know if that logistically tracks, but sure. But this is Sturmon, privateer extraordinaire, which is just a really nice way to say pirate with the appropriate paperwork. And he seems to want Alina for the bounty money. But now the crows are on a little detour to clear their name and also for Kaz's revenge plot. They officially pick up Wyland, the demolitions expert, an adorable little love interest of Jesper, though not a fan of how they handle that on the show. Six of Crows has them like bantering and building up that they're into each other and it's like adorable. And then the show changes changes it to them having had a one night stand at some point, but Jesper forgot about it for a few episodes. And that just makes their dynamic going forward feel weird. I just wasn't a fan. And they get Nina because she overheard them talking about needing a heart render and offers up her services in exchange for getting Matthias a message in Hellgate. So the first part of the plan to regain their glory is blowing up the old Crows Club. This is war with Pekka Rollins, the king of the barrel. The barrel doesn't belong to kings. It belongs to bastards. But Pekka catches on to their plans pretty quickly and it's not great. Thankfully, he wasn't banking on them having a heart render and they all managed to get away, though Inej now has a sick fuck known as the taxidermist on her trail. He likes souvenirs. And she's rightfully pissed because she can tell that there's like another reason why Kaz is going in so hard on him. The second he says that Pekka killed his brother, that's all Inej needs to be all in. Pekka Rollins killed my brother. And we destroy him because they're crows. And there's a lot of fun here. She takes care of the weirdo. Kaz gets the dregs on his side by kicking their asses. This city's price is blood, and I am happy to pay with yours. What a f***ing badass. And Jesper and Wyland figure out that Pekka is hiding a son, and a son is leverage. Did you cut this wire? How dare you accuse him? Yeah. Uh, da, da. Uh, this is also when Wylan realizes that Jesper's a duress when he fixes the piano as their cover. And even though he's a little shit, Jesper's genuinely worried what Kaz might do if he finds out about Albie, but he already knew. He renamed the Crow Club the Kalish Prince, and Pekka would never see himself as anything other than a king. God, I love Kaz. Like, he has this extreme deductive reasoning, but it all checks out. But things might end up derailed by Nina. She heads to Hellgate to see Matthias and shows up right when he's about to go into the ring. He also currently hates her, or more maybe hates himself for not hating her, but he does believe that she betrayed him. But she tries to get his attention so intently that she gets Pekka's attention, who's there to watch the fights. And instead of busting her, he says that he can get Matthias out if she gets him Kaz. Now, I thought that that stuff was kind of stupid. Like, Hellgate is almost impossible to get into. It is literally 
literally why they have like an entire like it's like an infiltration mission in Six of Crows to get in there. So her just being like casually bopping in does not make sense. Either way, that is now looming as they devise their new plan. Wyland develops something that would mimic firepox. And in a port town, a highly contagious and lethal infection is going to cause massive frenzy. So they're going to spray it all through Pega's businesses with a trail leading back to his ships. And by the time the symptoms subside, the damage to his reputation will be done. Now on writing this and looking back, the fact that this is taking place in episode four shocked me. Like I thought this plan played out like way later in the series, uh, but then I remembered they kind of have to deal with this before they can actually get pulled into the grander story. So the plan is working and while they leave it in the air as to whether or not Nina is actually double crossing them, I believe the best in her. And she just had to make it look really good when she captured Kaz for Pekka, but it was just to get Kaz in a room with him. Also, he can reveal Pekka's hidden gem. I'd reconsider. If you want to see your Kalish prince again. What are you gonna do? You're gonna, you're gonna blow up again. Your other Kalish prince. I'll be. Says he buried the little shit alive and if Pekka doesn't agree to his terms, he'll never get there in time. Now mainly he wants Pekka to say his brother's name, remember what he did, who he fucked over, and eventually he remembers just not the name. Now thankfully Kaz is smart enough not to derail everything for this and gets Pekka to sign a confession for the murders he pinned on them and Inej's freedom. Now obviously Kaz didn't bury the kid alive, he just has him waiting out of the way so he could see his father arrested and sent to Hellgate. A perfect plan that probably just played out a little bit too early in the grand scheme of things. So how do they end up pulled back into Alina's business? Well, we'll get there, but they had to bend over backwards with some lore to make it work. So Alina and Mal end up on Sturman's boat as they're escaping, and thankfully he had no intention of handing her over to Fjordans for the bounty. He's even willing to help her track down the Sea Whip to tear down the fold. Basically, she believes that having two of Morozova's amplifiers should be enough to tear it down. And this is super different from the books. Like, Kerrigan is on this ship with them, and he's looking for the Sea Whip. But while trying to capture it, Sturman turns on him and captures the Sea Whip for Alina instead. Instead. And I'm really bummed that things didn't play out this way because this scene was all very exciting. But I still love Sturman. He's smug, but fun, and he's honorable even if he tries to hide it. And while it's very clear that we're supposed to be rooting for the romantic pairing between Mal and Alina, I just don't feel it now. And it's a combination of not really feeling any chemistry between them anymore and Mal not really being given a personality out of like, must find Alina, must protect Alina, must help Alina. She just seems to have significantly better banter with other people that she engages with. Like Zoya pops back up and and there was a moment where I was like, wait, were they trying to add like flirty vibes between them now? And no, they weren't. It doesn't help that it becomes clear through the show that Sturman's got a little crush on Alina and I want to root for him even though I should be all in on good guy Mal. Though anyone who's still pro Darkling, the dude who completely removed her autonomy to control her, manipulated her after locking her away, continues to see her as a possession, is willing to injure her to get what he wants. Like, please make me understand. Actually, don't. I don't. At this point, I don't ever want to hear shit about Edward Cullen with this dude bopping around. But thanks to Mal's tracking, they find the sea whip and Alina has to kill it because it was not as docile as the stag. And this all just plays out so terribly fast. Like they're immediately off to take down the fold, even though earlier on she was saying she had these visions that makes her think she's supposed to like get all of Morozova's amplifiers. Meaning that before going for the fold, they should be going for the firebird. Now in the book, this is something that the Darkling tells her he believes is fate based on the lives of the saints book. She's meant to have all the amplifiers and he's meant to rule. And that she'll never be able to have a happy life with someone like Mal, not only because she's gonna remain young for centuries, but also because she's so different. Mostly just exposing his own loneliness though. They kind of get around them not having these in-person conversations by maintaining a connection between the two of them that she initially believes are just hallucinations, but are actually a mental link as a result of the fragments of the stag bones still in his hand. And even though he is alive, he's not in the best of shape. The shadow monsters he made are called the Nietzsche Voice. And to make it out of the fold with them, he had to heavily rely on Merzost, which is a form of magic considered abomination that requires an unknown sacrifice. The last time it happened, it turned his blood black, and this time it's left him permanently scarred with debilitating headaches. I feel like he's a lot more one note this season and slightly less complex, and I wonder if it's because he's so shattered now. But he's pushing ahead with his plans of domination. He's pulling together any Grisha still loyal to him, and it's some like real Magneto energy. Like he's making fairly good points about how his entire group of people have been treated throughout history the torture, the killing, but because he knows they're more powerful and believes it's his right to rule everything, his actions are always gonna get a little bit genocidal. Basically someone who started with like not bad intentions, but is now just doing very bad things to his ends. And like all of these classic tales of good and evil, there needs to be a counterbalance to defeat it, which is Alina. And he absolutely still sees her as his possession when he feels her getting the second amplifier. You've grown stronger, my Alina. 
no, she's not yours, you sick fuck. But even if these are all like themes and tropes we've seen before, I really like how they play out here, especially for YA fantasy. And even though I definitely prefer a lot of what the book is doing and how they like flesh out a lot of that lore, I still find the show super fun. And while the Darkling still has many loyal followers, including this little weirdo that was created just for the show to have someone hiding one of Morozova's journals for him and his mother, Bagra, apparently, some aren't so on board, like Jenya, who he saved before the first army was about to feed her to the fold, but she still remembers the monster he was and the things he made her do. And his actions in the first season leading to this renewed blatant hatred, torture, and persecution of Grisha is a big reason that Bagra's no longer on his side. She realizes that she made the mistake of never teaching him compassion in addition to all of the self-preservation and greatness. Says he's now set Grisha back hundreds of years in terms of acceptance. But he doesn't want acceptance now, he wants total domination. I should have murdered the first king I ever met and taken his crown. This time, I shan't stop at a palace. The entire country will be ours. A little empire. But once David and Genya realize that there is a connection between the Darkling and Alina, they want to run away with Morozova's journal to prevent the Darkling from causing any more harm and warn Alina. And while David does make it out, Genya is brutalized. She cannot catch a break. Now seeing as we're three episodes in, Alina obviously doesn't take down the fold. That connection to the Darkling seems to be blocking her, but hey, Shmarmy Bastard has a flying ship. This honestly just seemed like a way to bypass the ship fight with the Darkling Darkling to have them set up for the big reveal that Sturmond is Nikolai Lantsov, Prince of Ravka. You lying bastard! See, they're perfect together, so feisty. But he's a good guy prince, he's protecting Grisha at one of his palaces, something he believes his brother and current heir to the throne would take issue with. So his method of trying to create peace is suggesting an engagement with Alina to unite Grisha and Ravka. And he doesn't even do it in a weird way, like he knows she loves Mal and he genuinely cares about her happiness. I've seen what you both mean to each other. I understand if you decline. My heart is set elsewhere. I wanted to be happy. See what I mean about them making it hard to root against him? And this is where Alina reunites with some people from the palace, like Nadia, who's been recast, and Zoya, who's no longer a standoffish or a racist, thankfully. And after seeing how much a dick Vasily is and his genuine disdain for Grisha, Alina agrees to marry Nikolai and says she wants to take over the second army. But makes that decision before officially telling Mal, so while he knew it was a possibility, he is blindsided. You're my flag, Alina. You are my nation. No, not cringe. This man is already batting against the averages for the hearts of viewers and you give him cringe? It reminds me of the vows in Wedding Crashers. Take you, Craig, to be my best friend and my captain. For the love of God, give this man a personality outside puppy dogging around for Alina. But he's willing to put up with it and while looking for information on the Firebird, he comes across a legendary Shuhan sword that should be able to cut through the Darkling's monsters. And Nikolai suggests that the Crows might just be the perfect crew to track it down. So that's how they end up involved. But shit hits the fan pretty quickly. Vasily has Mal arrested for being a deserter because he's trying to clear the way to get Alina to marry him instead. She says no, but then he over invites people to the engagement party and the Darkling attacks. And Vasily instantly dies. I really thought he was shaping up to be a regular annoyance, but nope. Barely an inconvenience. Again, just a byproduct of how quickly this is all streamlined. Like they spend a fair amount of time at this palace before shit hits the fans in the books. And when Alina knew that the Darkling was still alive at this point, she now realizes how strong the connection is between them when she believes she's having a conversation with him in a hallway, but he's just mentally keeping her away from the fight because he knows he can't fully control his Nichevoya. When she again turns down his plan for shared world domination, they fight, which causes a part of the palace to collapse, letting anyone on that side escape through the underground Ground tunnels. And while that was all going down, Bagra and Jenya managed to escape and make their way to Alina because Jenya could track David's heart. And that stuff cuts so deep. Like Jenya's shattered and angry in so many ways, but David's working so hard to make her see her worth outside of physical beauty. And thankfully Nikolai isn't a sack of shit, so when he realizes how much of a monster the king was to her, he says he'll pardon her for the murder and even goes at his mom for allowing those things to happen. Your subjects were to be like your children, all of them. But it's time to speed run some of the awkwardness between Mal and Alina. While Bagra is trying to instruct her on how to break the connection with the Darkling, Mal finds his way back and distracts her long enough to prevent it from happening. So she gets pretty pissed at him, whereas in the book, a lot more time has passed and Alina is really struggling a lot with her differences, even to other Grisha and Mal's senses are changing. And is also obviously struggling with her being betrothed and having to keep up those appearances. And there's so much more drama here, but like Mal assuming that Alina's not into him because of the connection with the Darkling, he ends up kissing 
using Zoya to prove a point. It's just like teenage angst and reacting poorly to a situation out of his control. In the show, it's mostly that he's starting to believe that she's more than him, that he'll help her find the firebird and that's all he's really good for in her grand story. But as we will quickly learn, Mal is the descendant of the firebird. The reason why it's the only one he hasn't felt drawn to is because it's him. And we get some rapid lore delivery. Bagra was Morozova's daughter and the reason he was imprisoned as a saint was because he resurrected a drowned child. But it wasn't any child. It was his other daughter that Bagra had drowned and using Mirzas to bring her back made her a powerful amplifier and it's been passing around from generation to generation before hitting Mal. And that's why he can always find Alina. It's why he's settled into the same orphanage she was at. It's why all the other amplifiers rang to him. He's genetically predispositioned to be attached to her because of the works of a saint. Which immediately made me start to question the nature of their love. If it was real at all, if there was ever any genuine connection there. Or does something like this make that connection more genuine because it's actually destined? Similar to the whole does Edward actually love Bella for Bella or is it the combination of her blood and not being able to hear her thoughts? I believe he loves her but not as much as Alice. Either way, the only way she can fully utilize her amplified powers without falling into Mirzost use like the Darkling is to kill Mal, which he's accepted. And she has not. But I'll never know a love more than this. Bestie, I don't know about that. But now the Darkling realizes that he can do things to Alina physically through their connection. He attacked her when they were at Morozova's workshop and Bagra sacrifices herself to get Alina out. She tries to kill her son, but then the shadow monsters insta-kill her, but she manages to use the last of her strength to cut off his hand and sever the connection. And something I liked, he was genuinely more upset about losing his mom than what she did to him. Because she's literally been the one and only constant in his entire miserable long life. But now he also knows that Mal is the firebird because this weirdo has been messing around with Bagra's finger bone for amplification. And when he uses it to amplify the Darkling's powers, he gets some of her final memories. So that's not good. I will say in the book, he never wants to admit that Mal is anything important at all. Like that's how much he like disregards him. But Alina's group does come up with a plan to scam the situation. Cut Mal's fingers off, fuse it to Alina, then have a heart render stop his heart temporarily while she destroys the fold. So we're kind of in the end zone here. Nikolai's headed off to the front lines to battle the Darkling's forces and Alina's off to the fold. But not before this super emotional moment between Nikolai and Mal. Just deserve her. But man, sure would be great to have that sword that can cut through shadows. Back to the crow's time. Now initially Kaz was trying to send Inej away and I saw some people take his words at face value that like he actually felt that her being distracted during the mission meant that she wasn't reliable when it was like clearly just because he wants to keep her safe and away from danger now that she's free. But she literally believes that Alina's a saint so she's all in. Zoya and Talia team up with them to find the sword and track it back to the disciple, someone who liked to steal saintly relics. Which leads them to this woman who they believe is the real disciple because of how calm her heartbeat is and how quickly she saw them out. And they fall right into her trap, which is poison that seems to affect them all in slightly different ways. Inej imagines that Kaz is finally willing to be open with her and be with her, but knew so deeply that it was fake that she eventually wakes up. Kaz is haunted the worst by his brother saying that revenge won't bring him peace. But Jesper hallucinates his mom and it almost seems like he's really talking to her in death a bit. So like we learn that he conceals his abilities because his father said they might get him killed and that his mom was killed when she used them. And that was really nice. She was just encouraging him to be himself, explaining why it's important to always like stand up for what you believe in. And I feel like the show really does nail so many of these emotional moments. But you know, they are still dying. Thankfully, Inej wakes up and Wyland takes a shot and an antidote and they live to scheme another day. And this leads them to a section that genuinely made me tear up. The tea woman is a saint. She's the one who made and wielded the blade. And this man they found in her house is what she's been trying to protect, her love who's now suffering some of the issues of old age. And Cass calls him her weakness as it cuts back to the Darkling in pain. 400 years I've been alive. I've seen them all die. My family, all my loved ones. So she started to close her off from everything until she allowed herself to fall in love. And this shit made me cry. Like it was such a beautiful little conversation. Thankfully, she finally realizes that their intentions are good, gives them the blade, and Jesper gets a nice little final kick in the butt not to hide his abilities. So she's not technically in the books. Like she is a saint in the universe and she's mentioned in passing, but like not actually featured to this extent. So like, that's what I mean by them like digging into the lore to make the crows involved. I still don't know how I feel about that specifically 
quickly because I like how so many of these individual scenes play out, but just like not necessarily how they tie into the greater story, but back to the fight. And they're not going great. They amplified some Grisha with the last of Bagra's bone fragments. So they're causing massive damage, putting Nikolai on the run and his best friend tragically dies saving him. And the Darkling is attacking with a shadow so they don't even have time to try the fake killing Mal before running off to the fold. And just as Alina's about to get drug away by the Nietzsche Voya, Inej pops up with the blade. <laughs> Though this was kind of hilarious to me. Santa Alina, please. There's no need for such courtesies. Not amongst friends. Yeah, everyone else though, you better drop your fucking knees for St. Helena. And the rest of the crows are off to even the field. We got Waylon's explosive, Jesper taking tips and using his buttons to cut off this one's fingers. It's like badass, but I also just like don't care about any of Kerrigan's people. And they make pretty quick work of them before Nikolai shoots her in the throat. That is brutal, my guy. But now the shadow monsters have started to infiltrate the palace, which brought another tearjerker moment when David forces Jenya away to hide and he seems to end up dead. Like her scream. Oh my God. And then in the next episode, she finds his plans to craft her an engagement ring. Like, holy shit, what a rough life she is living. Can someone throw her a bone? But in the fold, Alina feels like she can still amplify herself without having to kill Mal. And she's managing well enough by finally doing the cut, but Val gets caught in the crossfire and Nina's knocked out and can't help. And it seems like Alina's gonna let the whole thing go to shit to try to keep Mal alive until he forces her to finish him off and amplify. And angry power is excessive. She just immediately blows up the fold. But because Kirigan isn't dead, the shadow monsters remain. And he's trying to express that destroying the fold isn't actually gonna change anything. People are still gonna hate Grisha. They're gonna end up hating her. The world doesn't need a saint to protect it, Alina. It needs a monster. Let me be your monster. And he genuinely believes that she's just gonna end up like him, miserable and alone, and they're the only people who will ever understand one another. Which is when his shadow monsters attack her because he literally can't control them. <laughs> and this stupid fuck still thinks he actually loved her? He thinks he just made like a little oopsie and lost it all, not that he turned her into a literal object he could control for power against her will, using her the exact opposite way she was promised and intended. But hey, he gives her the opening to stab the bitch. Without me, no, they will come for you. Yeah, people can suck. Doesn't mean she has to. But as much as she says she'll never be like the Darkling, she uses Mirzas to bring Mal back from the dead. Horrifying Nina, and that does come as a cost. The piece of Mal that always led him to Alina, the connection he felt to all of it is gone, cause it's in her now. Now he's not sure if he ever really did love her or if it was just blood, blood that dictated every moment of his life. I don't know what I'm meant for. You were meant? Damn, Alina, give the man something. But hey, he knows what he was around for, literally lays out that he was meant for her as a mythical amplifier to help her achieve the unachievable, and he fulfilled it. And instead of just going back to being a soldier in her army, Nikolai bestows upon him the name of Sturmon to be a privateer. Hopefully he picks up some more pizzazz on his voyages. They essentially decide that if they find each other after all of this, they'll know it's real, that it was choice. Basically leaving an opening for Melina fans, but freeing her up for some other dalliances. So this is very different from the books where Heartrenders do actually manage to save Mal. And when she takes him in as the third amplifier, she actually loses her powers. It transfers them to all the people around her to use against the fold. There's just so much interesting stuff about Morozova in the books that I hope that we get to at some point in the show. But that was the real gift and intention of his amplifiers. It would leave the user without powers, but then it would just create a bunch of new Grisha. Increasing your power a thousand fold, just not in you. And this is when it becomes very clear that the Darkling doesn't actually give a shit about her as a person. The second she's normal, he wants nothing to do with her. He just desperately wanted someone he could spend eternity with and it didn't matter who. Yeah, that's just the love interest we want to stand. I'm sorry. We can argue that there's more nuance. I'm still just never gonna be on his side. Then they fake Alina's death so no one will come after her and she lives out her life with Mal taking care of children after rebuilding the orphanage they grew up in. No powers means she gets to live a normal life. And while that's a nice, happy, peaceful ending, I do really like that they had Mal reassess his purpose after all that happened. That it's absolutely something that would end up affecting your self-perception. But Alina still very much has her powers here. And even though the tides are going to flip on her at 
some point, as Kaz points out, she's going to continue the charade of marrying Nikolai. Because even with the fold gun, the world needs to be brought back together, and he knows it's going to be even harder than the battle itself. And speaking of Nikolai, he is now scarred by the Darkling Shadow Monster, so that's definitely going to be a thing. It's like a way bigger moment in the book, but yeah. And it was around here that I really just thought that the episode was going to end, but like, it just keeps going. It shows Matthias at Hellgate agreeing to fight for Pekka Rollins, but Nina has a pardon for him that tragically gets ignored, so they can still probably do the ice heist in a future season or spinoff. So his life is basically about to be more hell. Again, it does not make sense that they just keep sending Nina here all alone. Like, this is not a normal prison. This is like a once you're here, you don't get out type place. Then we get a speed up with the Inej and Kaz storyline. He like ultimately admits that he actually wants to be with her, but she turns him down because she doesn't know why he's so closed off. I will have you without your armor, Gasbrecher. I will not have you at all. And it seems cruel, but like that's a genuine concern for her to have. And that's kind of why I didn't love that Nina heard everything with Pekka Rollins. And then when they're burning the Darkling's body, there's like a random bee out there, which makes no sense because anything in that area should be dead. And this is some foreshadowing for later books. So it seems like they're definitely hoping to continue on with the Scars duology. After the fold comes down, there's like a series of little miracles related to certain saints happening. And one of them had bees as a symbol. So what the show does do is leave things open for Alina to become overly enamored with power. One of Kerrigan's remaining supporters attacks everyone during the celebration until Alina uses the cut on her. And at first she's horrified and then you can tell she liked it. And that's a cliffhanger. So very different stories. Maybe it'll all end in the same way. And in like in some ways I like it as a story that has the intention of continuing on. It made sense in the book. She used Mirzas to weaken the Darkling. And this she used it for selfish reasons and that's very different and opens up doors for many different types of consequences. And this heart render was so powerful because she'd taken Jirta Perem, which is a highly addictive drug that amplifies Grisha powers, but eventually starts to destroy the body, which is one of the main focal points in the Six of Crows, so they're just setting that up here too. Basically, the last 40 minutes of this episode is just massive setups for future seasons and potential spinoffs. And it was kind of a lot. Like, I think a lot of the Crow stuff should have just been held off. It felt like it was like first episode stuff, not like season finale stuff. So like so much stuff is happening after what felt like the logical wrap-up point to the season and it's a little odd and I think that's an issue with the last few episodes of this show it just starts feeling so messy and I feel like it's fine for casual watching and some of the overall big changes they make are actually good and interesting to explore but it's just handled so rapidly that the stakes just aren't there but that's pretty much it I am still very excited to see where they take things I really like the Grishaverse even outside the crows I think the books have a lot of interesting added lore with the saints and a lot of other stuff that we just lose out on here and this season is just different from the source material in so many ways that like those books are just like a very interesting thing that get to exist uniquely on their own. So I guess if you ever want to deep dive on those, let me know. Maybe I can make it happen, but that is pretty much going to do it. Let me know what you guys thought of this season of Shadow and Bone down below. Did you love it? Did you hate it? Did you like a lot of it and then feel it got messy? But thank you all so much for watching. Thanks as always to my Patreon supporters and YouTube channel members. Subscribe to the channel if you're new. Leave a like on the video if you're into that kind of thing. I hope you're all having a fantastic day. I'm mostly okay. Okay, and we'll catch you all later.